Hey everyone, welcome to the PC Perspective Podcast. This is episode 548, being recorded Thursday, June 27th, 2019. I'm Jim Tennis. I'm Jeremy Hellstrom. I'm Josh Walrath. I'm Sebastian Peek. And we're glad you could join us. We're a day late. We normally record Wednesday nights, uh, although we've had to rearrange our schedule a little bit uh, in recent weeks. I uh, apologize for that. But you can always know when we go live by going to pcpro.com slash subscribe, uh, where we can join our live mailing list. We use it only to let you know when we go live. We send it out about an hour or so before our shows. Or you can check out the, the live stream and the schedule at pcpro.com slash live. Uh, of course, if you want to support us here at PC Per, head to patreon.com slash pcper. Uh, where you can uh, give a, a monthly donation to help us out. We really appreciate it. And uh, if you do uh, become a new patron during the live stream or increase your pledge during the live stream, uh, edit your name field before you do that. I'll get an email and I will read out uh, live on air anything you put in that name field. So it's a good opportunity to have some fun at our expense. Uh, so check that out if, if you're interested. And of course, uh, if you want to... Uh, Check out some merchandise, uh, help us out, head to joshtech.com, that's J-O-S-H-T-E-K-K.com, which is our Teespring store where we have t-shirts and mugs. Uh, you get something cool, we get a little bit of a cut, and it also helps us out here, so we really appreciate that. Uh, but uh, I'm not feeling great, so we're going to just try to push through this show as quickly as we can, and uh, and uh, let's, so let's just get started. We've got a few quick announcements. Uh, first of all, uh, ne- uh, I guess tomorrow, so we're recording this Thursday, so Friday night at 10 p.m., uh, for about 50, hopefully 15 minutes, but it might be longer if things don't go well. The website will be down. So 10 p.m. Eastern, Friday the 28th, the website will be down uh, to patch our Intel processor. Uh, so hooray for chill. Yeah, hooray for security patches because we're running our server on a system powered by an Intel um, Xeon chip, which needs to be patched for speculative execution vulnerabilities. So. Just to let you know, if you hit a if you hit it downtime tomorrow at ten, uh, that's the reason why. Uh, Blame also, Intel. It, yes, although AMD too, I guess, has some problems, which we'll talk about this. Well, week. true. Yeah. Also, next week's show, I'm going to be in San Jose next week uh, for a few meetings. I'll be there Wednesday, or, or sorry, Tuesday through late Thursday. So we're going to do the podcast out there, but due to the issues or due to the technical difficulties, we're not going to have it live like we do now. So we'll have a podcast next week, but it will be on demand only. So there'll be no live stream uh, for next week's show. That'll be episode 549, but you'll still get something in your RSS feed like on Thursday uh, night or Friday morning, depending on when I can get uh, some upload bandwidth. Sorry. So, uh, yeah, I'm fine. Uh, So they're making you work over July 4th? They is me, yes. (laughs) Slave driver. Uh, no, it'll be all right. It'll be fine. I'll uh, I'll figure it out. But um, I'll be in a nice... Take the you know, first off. It's Canada Day. Uh, yeah, so. I guess I could. I could just there do that. There uh, Also, uh, we launched a little bit of a giveaway this week. The Steam Summer Sale just went live on... Um, was it Monday? Tuesday? It was earlier this week. It went live. It's on yeah. until the 9th. You know, so you got a couple weeks here. And we thought, let's let's take an opportunity to have a giveaway. So we're giving away three gift cards. There'll be one $100 gift card and two $50 gift cards uh, for Steam. And uh, you have until, uh, I believe it's um, uh, July 1st, Monday, July 1st at 11.59 p.m. Eastern. Uh, you have to enter. So head to our website. It's one of the featured stories at the top. You can find it there. And uh, we're using the Gleam system. So you, there's just uh, different ways to enter to, to create entries. And we'll draw three winners uh, right then on July 1st uh, at midnight, basically. And uh, you have a chance to win a gift card. So check that out if you're interested. And uh, the way Steam, it used to be that they'd have flash deals that were time limited. But the way the last few sales have gone, every discount and every game stays the same throughout the whole sale. They just feature different games throughout the week. So uh, with this, even though you're not going to get it till July 1st, you're not going to miss anything. So if there's a game you want, you'll still have time to pick it up at its discounted price after winning uh, this little contest. So uh, so yeah, check that out. Check that out if you're interested. But um, let's uh, jump right into the stories for the week. We've got a couple of reviews. Uh, the first up is a review of a Cherry gaming mouse. Cherry, the, uh, the, the uh, company that is starting to break into the peripheral business now. 
and they've got a, a Cherry MW8 Advanced Wireless Mouse. So this is a wireless mouse. Uh, it's, you know, Chris, Chris reviewed this for us. It's sort of a gaming mouse, although it's, as he says, it's it's got a very um, sleek or, you know, a corporate design. As You know, there's no RGB. There's no aggressive styling on it. It's a very slick looking, uh, nice mouse. I think at one point in the review, he says it. It's something that would look at home on a CEO's desk, not necessarily a gamer's desk. Uh, but uh, you take a look at the product specifications, and it's a, a, a more basic mouse. I think it's got a price of sixty dollars or a fifty fifty two. I'm sorry, fifty two twenty four currently at Amazon. But it's it's more basic. They don't advertise the polling rate. They don't advertise the sensor on the box. At least he figured out it was a PixArt sensor. Uh, it's got six programmable buttons. It's 92 What kind gram. of switches, though? Right. Well, we we would assume, Cherry, but I don't know. I don't know what they're into. Do they make those for that form factor? I don't know. A 550 milliamp hour battery that can get up for up to 70 hours on a single charge. It connects via both Bluetooth at, uh, I'm sorry, Bluetooth or 2.4 gigahertz RF. Uh, 92 gram weight. So, you know, a very simple refined mouse uh that he's that he uh he felt it or that he evaluated it as he said uh, it is very small though like it's hard to picture how small it is until you see it compared to a logitech mouse in one of his photos yeah and then is that a mini usb hand... port on the front uh yeah, yeah. or micro okay there like. you go be yeah, a micro yeah um let's see he does have a picture here it is okay yeah. so it's quite it's small more, but more like a travel mouse, you know, yeah. uh, in terms of size. Uh, he does say, though, that it, it with the uh, nonstick uh, feet on it, it glides very smoothly, more smoothly than a couple of the Logitech mice he compared it to, which is interesting because Logitech's usually pretty pretty good about the uh, the feet on their mice and sort of the, the surface movement. But he said it was, it, it was a very smooth experience. You can see it there in his hand. And so it's not one of those nice contoured mice. So it's, it's more you're going to have a finger grip on it than a, rather than a palm grip. But uh, you know his final conclusion was even though it's it's pretty refined, and even though it has some selectable uh, DPI uh, settings, I think it goes up to 3,200 DPI, which is more than fine for normal stuff. Some of some of those 10 plus thousand DPIs that we see on gaming mice aren't really usable uh, in, for most people in most uh, in, at most resolutions. Uh, but it's, you know, at, at the $60 retail price, $52 street price, it seems a little overpriced for what it is because it is lacking a lot of buttons. It's lacking a higher polling rate. If you do like RGB, obviously it's going to have, it's not going to have that. So uh, it's something to consider, but he, he didn't give it an award. He just didn't feel that it, it really stood out at that price. But uh, check out the full review if you're interested in something like a little more compact that has a more subtle look to it uh let's check out i really the have to know if it's mechanical though yeah <laughs> if if they're releasing a mouse without mechanical switches that shame on them yeah even if it's just like a useless decorative switch in the back i mean just something but onto something much bigger and heavier indeed uh sebastian has a review for us of the scythe mugen is it mugen the hell you i've been that? saying mugen Mu Mujin? Mujin? No, Mujin. 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 I think. I'm not sure. Well, no, we all is. know. Yes. It's the new Tough Gaming Alliance version. The Mujin 5 has been out. I reviewed it back in like 2017 for the site. And this new version has RGB lighting. And as we all know, RGBs make computers faster. So can RGBs make coolers cooler? That's the big question. That was the, uh, that's what I set out to find out. I threw this up on the test bench the other day. And uh, I will say the looks of this thing are probably going to be a bit galvanizing, if that's the right word. Because it's, without the lighting, it's just a black fan with white blades and this orangey yellow accent. And that's the so when you when you see it, do you start singing black and yellow, black and yellow, black and mm -hmm. no? Well, yeah, I, I see black well, I and do. yellow. I do. I thought I was alone. Yeah, Wiz there. Khalifa would would that is Wiz Khalifa's fan. <sighs> I'm ashamed to say my wife had a copy of that album. Uh, <laughs> trying desperately to get back on track here. 
if you've seen the Asus Tough Gaming stuff, we've talked about it a few times this year. We looked at it at CES. It's their new sort of entry level gamer branded like motherboard lineup. And there's a whole bunch of stuff now with this Tough Gaming Alliance uh, like branding and aesthetic. And if you look at the Asus website, you can see there's a bunch of different companies making coolers now that sort of match their motherboards. And this is one of them. What's interesting about this is that they've taken the Mugen 5 and they've put this RGB cap on the top of the heatsink, which is separately addressable. The fan and the top of the heatsink have these RGB cables for your motherboard, or you can daisy chain them together and then plug them into one available RGB header. But regardless of what you do, it's interesting. I've never seen an air cooler with a cap on the heat sink with RGB lighting in it. So that's something. It does raise the price though. The Mugen 5 was a very good cooler for its price range of under $50, like $45, $48. And this is around $60. They do have some refinements to it, like a little bit of uh, better mounting system. It's like the third version of their high pressure mounting system now. It, it installs just fine. There's absolutely no component clearance issues. It's a asymmetrical design that leans away from your RAM, so it doesn't pose any kind of RAM clearance issue at all, even with the fan installed. And it's on the test bench, yeah, it, it has a bit of a rackish angle, I guess. Yeah. Uh, so how come you didn't put it on a fine. tough motherboard? I guess I don't have one. Oh I, I man! That and then That's I looked tough. around. I, yeah, I know it was. I have Strix and ROG, but I didn't have Tough. That's, That's too bad because I'd be curious be what uh, all the time. what that looks like. Uh, you know, with their their kind of tough color scheme, which isn't as fun as it used to be, but I guess it's still kind of okay. Yeah, you liked the old armored Tough thing, right? Yeah, I did. I did. Mm. Those ceramic cool, heat like sinks. That Those things were monsters. Thing. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, but they weren't the Gigabyte, but, which had the uh, bullets and magazines. Oh, yeah. Like. What was that yeah. Gigabyte? I still have that damn shirt. Oh, that was, well, that was Gigabyte. Gigabyte. Okay. It was Gigabyte. Yeah, yeah. You need to wear that shirt again Don't someday miss on the podcast. Haven't thrown it out yet. All right. Anyway, to wrap this up, the I compared it to the coolers I've tested recently in the thirty to sixty dollar range. So it went up against that. Be quiet. Dark Rock Slim, which is 60 bucks, same price as this. And then, of course, there is no such thing as a cooler review without Hyper 212 Evos in it, or there shouldn't be. So I, I added that and the RGB Black edition of the Hyper 212 Evo to get your RGB fix, although, of course, it does not have Ooh. that glowing top panel on it. This thing fares very well. It's within about a half a degree of that RGB version of the Evo, and it puts out the second least amount of noise under load I've tested recently, the Be Quiet is lowest. It has a very quiet, very low RPM fan. This one, a little bit louder, not bad. You're in that 34 decibel range under load, which is totally fine. And I couldn't hear it over room ambient. Like anything 30 to 31 is beyond the scope of my sound meter. So ignore those. That means it was below ambient room noise. But under load, barely hear it. Way quieter than an Intel stock cooler, quieter than a uh, Hyper 212 by far. So ultimately, though, it's not the best value because you're paying more for the, the, the RGB effects. So if you like the look and it's worth the extra 12 or 13 bucks over the standard non-RGB version, then that's fine. You know, it's, it's got very good performance and even better noise output. So... So one of those technically, kind of like look. you've proven that RGBs do make coolers cooler in this case. I think it depends on how you are defining the word cooler. Let's, let's talk about the micro piezo effect of running RGB LEDs on there. And they're actually sucking in the power, the, the heat, to help light them up. It's it's known fact. It's known. Yeah. You know, it's it's like those. Uh, um, what are the coolers that use? Peltier, uh, like the heat exchanger thing. Peltier. Uh, yes, thank you. Yeah, Peltier. <laughs> like that. Every cooler yes, with RGB. Peltier. Is, now he gets it. <laughs> well, while we were Peloton, talking about a Peloton cooler. 
Mm. While, while we were so talking when you about ride that, your peloton, someone... do you wear a helmet? Uh, if you're not way. wearing a helmet, then you know the, those extra grams of weight on your head they probably affect the overall workout in relation to like a real bike ride. That's a great point, Josh. Thank you. Now, a normal Thanks helmet or an RGB helmet? You know, I've actually seen RGB cooler. lighting for bikes now, like bicycles. Oh, god, gotcha. yeah. You, you put them all around the rim, and they have them for like the handlebars and stuff. But the battery oh, pack. They're like the size of a Coke can. You're supposed to like strap mm-hmm. it to the frame. It looks ridiculous. Well, the ones that rely on persistence of vision to spell out words on the spokes are kind of neat. Mm-hmm. That's as far as I go. Now, you uh, had something to say if you're a list leader. Oh, I was going to say, while we were talking about that review, someone is trying to change my password at PC Per. So, nice. Okay. Brett, if you're watching, Way I to go, hope Chris. to God that I hope that's you. <laughs> I hope because he said he said he was troubleshooting the Sendy thing. So hopefully, but otherwise, uh, yeah, something something's going down. Okay. Um, but let's move on, and hopefully the site will still be under my control when we're done with this. But uh, okay, let's jump into the news. So the uh, the first news story we've got this happened I think just after last week's podcast, but obviously Intel facing as strong of a threat from AMD as they've faced in 15 plus years. And the, it's not that Intel has bad parts. Okay. Brett just confirmed it was him changing my password. Thank God. Okay. All right. Moving on. Uh, it's not that Intel has bad parts. It's that the pricing to performance for their Ryzen parts um, is just not lining up based on what we've seen or what we expect Ryzen to hit. Obviously we haven't, tested Ryzen yet. We're relying on AMD specifications and their own benchmarks. We will be testing the full Ryzen lineup when it launches. But uh, as of what we expect, as of now, for what we expect Intel and AMD to fall at, Intel's prices are just too high for their comparative performance to Intel, or I'm sorry, to to Ryzen, to AMD. So the rumor is that Intel will be slashing prices on their core desktop lineup by up to 15%. We don't know for sure which prices or which models will see the price differences, but if you assume that it's the, uh, you know, that the top end ones, the most expensive ones, will get that 15% cut, like the 9900K, that could be 75 bucks off the 9900K if it's 15%. We also don't know exactly how this will, will happen for consumers. Will it be, you know, straight to retail, or will this be something that Intel cuts for their retail partner or their retail vendors and OEMs? And then those get passed on to consumers. So we'll see how this shakes out. But uh, we've heard now from multiple sources that Intel is going to be doing this. Intel, of course, has no official comment, uh, but wouldn't be surprised to see this uh, come to pass in the next uh, week or so as we get ready for Ryzen on the, on July 7th. What do you guys think? Well, since we already know the... Uh, make sure I'm unmuted. Yeah, I am. Shocking. Um since we essentially already know the rise in prices, then Intel can kind of take a look at that. And, you know, like in, like in their, their memo said, that the AMD maybe not is relying on performance as much as they are these high thread counts. And even though IPC has been greatly improved over the past three years since Ryzen was released, um, or at least we assume so. I don't know. We haven't really, you know, tested the 3000 yet and have official benchmarks, just, you know, what AMD has said. Still, they're they're running 7 nanometer. They've got, I mean, these 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 chiplets are, are really small. The I.O. chips are much larger. I mean, they're apparently built on 12 and 14 nanometer, depending on, on which SKU you got, whether it's um, the desktop or uh, or the Epic uh, server market. But, I mean, they're, they're just tiny and you can put a lot of those on any single seven nanometer wafer and even though you're paying more for a seven nanometer wafer you still got really 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 small chips that are pretty efficient and they still run at relatively high speeds and again if if amd has has hit uh the performance metrics of of what they've been promising in, in terms of ipc and and how much they can kind of scale that outwards in terms of core counts and threads then they've got, you know, something that would make Intel a little afraid. I mean, it's not like super afraid because Intel has a tremendous amount of manufacturing behind them. A lot of OEM deals, a lot of consumer deals, 
I mean, it's not like they're going to wither and, and fade away within a year of, of this Ryzen 3000, but we can we can expect to see AMD start taking market share and start making more money. And if they continue to execute and next year have, you know, a seven nanometer plus product that runs a little bit faster, then they will continue to keep pace with Intel and, and their eventual jump to 10 nanometers. But in the meantime, I think they want to keep their um, their kind of their market share rather than margins they're willing to sacrifice because they're still up in the mid 60 60 percent in uh, in margins so it's it's you know they're making a tremendous amount of money each each quarter far more than what amd does but it's interesting to see them take steps to kind of cut amd a little bit off at the pass until they can get 10 nanometer parts out because what is it, Whiskey Lake? What is the first? Icy Lake? I can't remember. There's too damn many. But they're, they're 10 nanometer um, uh, ultra low power product. Looks pretty good Comet. from the leaks. What's that? I mean, I think that was the Comet Lake, I think. Comet Lake? Is I can't remember. There's the too damn yeah. many. But anyway, oh, their first 10 nanometer part. Yeah, there's too many lakes. It's, it's like Minnesota. Is that Land of Lakes too? Well, it's it's landed ten thousand lakes and five thousand fish. It's a, anyway, it's a bad. So bad yeah, it's uh, it's you know we don't know the entire story behind this. I mean, they are paying attention to AMD. Obviously, AMD's come a long ways in a pretty short amount of time. Well, okay, maybe in the past six years when they started working on Zen and saying we need to get rid of bulldozer, we need to start you know cutting out the fat. We need to focus on what we do well and do it even better. And so it's been a long time in coming. And Intel is certainly paying attention. Uh, and, well, they should. Yeah. Any and price cut is good. Like In the market we are seeing right now, any price cut, I, I honestly don't even care if it's something I'd never consider buying, is good for the, the entire uh, consumer place. Like, the, there was just a, a story put out not too long ago about how, oh, once again, the desktop computers are dead. No one's buying computers. Like, well, one, no compelling releases uh, yet. We're, we're all sort of waiting for uh, 7 7 or various dates in between now and then. <clears throat> but w- when you're looking at the prices, it's they're insane. Uh, it, it just, it's, it, they've gone up. Well, costs go up and everything, but income hasn't. And, you know, it's not, there's nothing that's driving you to, all right, I'm going to switch to eating packets of ramen for a month so I can afford to buy a brand new machine because I'm not spending 10 grand on the body processor. I'm not spending six, $700 on a, a high end, not counting motherboard, not counting DDR4. Uh, hell, I mean, at least flash is starting to get cheap for storage, but any price cut has got to be good for the market and for the consumers at this point. Yeah. And that's, that's really the, the biggest thing I think for, you know, obviously there's a whole group of, of AMD fans who have long been distrustful and upset with Intel, uh, conspiracy theorists or just anti, anti corporate, you know, mindsets, whatever. Uh, and regardless of whether any of those feelings are justified, you know they're happy for this, but but in general, the 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 best part about AMD being better is not AMD being better in a vacuum, but AMD now challenging the market for competition, and having prices come down, and having Intel, even if these rumors of price uh, cuts turn out not to be true, the fact that they got to the point where we've heard from multiple sources that they're at least thinking strongly about it, that's that's huge because Intel doesn't cut prices, like they just don't. That's not one of their things, and and so to have them even think about it to the point where it gets out into the channel is is uh is significant so and of course going forward their next even if they don't cut current ninth gen desktop when they get to 10th gen they'll they'll be priced out of the gate with this new competition in mind uh which is good everything's good competition lowering prices hurrah just no more no more security patches please from anybody (laughs) well i got bad news for you Yes, yes. Well, we'll get to that in a second. But uh, all right. So just be on the lookout. We'll 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 let you know if uh, Intel has any more official news on pricing for for their desktop pro- processors as we get closer to Ryzen's launch. 
Uh, but uh, first, uh, or before that, uh, before we talk about uh, the story Jeremy alluded to, uh, let's mention a quick story here about Edge or Credge, the Chromium-based Edge, the beta of Microsoft's second attempt at uh, Edge, and uh, it is now available for Windows 7 and 8, something that was never going to happen with original Edge. What do we call that? Original Edge? Edge 1.0? Vanilla Edge? True Edge? Vanilla Edge, I think, is uh, yeah. the way to go. So that was a Windows 10 exclusive. So if you wanted Edge, you had to run Windows 10. But part of the promise of having this new Chromium-based Edge, which, again, is still in beta, is that it will be out for not only Windows 10, but Mac OS and Windows 7 and 8. Although you don't get quite everything that the Windows 10 version gets. Right, Jeremy? Uh, well, I mean, do you really want everything that the Windows 10 version <laughs> gives you? Well, maybe. Dark mode? That's sort of cool. Oh, well, yeah, I suppose everything has to have a dark mode nowadays. And, well, I'm sorry to say this isn't going to give it to you. And the other thing is, uh, if you are actually screwing around with Azure, you don't get the proper links to Active Directories. It still loads a, a page, but it, it, it really doesn't work very... It works about as well as it does an Internet Explorer at this point to be perfectly honest. It's it's worth testing out, uh, especially if you're doing any sort of uh, compatibility testing because this is going to be a thing. It's going to be a thing very soon. And it's lovely in that all of a sudden my Chrome users aren't running into the same incompatibility problems that they were on SharePoint and various other Microsoft products, which I am positive is totally unrelated to this. I couldn't have anything whatsoever to do with it. I've tried to play with it. Uh, it kind of went wonky, uh, which was probably my fault because I was testing it late when I was a little too tired and inebriated to really know what the hell I was doing, which also may have been why I was testing it to begin with. I'm going to try it again. And honestly, it, it, I, uh, the, everything I use now offers dark mode. I've never even turned it on, so I'm not going to miss that. And... Well, I let other people play with Azure, and for you, the the, the normal user, it, it matters not at all. And it's worth trying out because it's the mo one of the most bizarre moves for Microsoft we have ever seen. Yeah, remember but... the days of antitrust, where I know it, it's not separate; it has to be used with Windows. Like it, it has to be there, and then they had to figure out how to unbundle it. Mm -hmm. and to sort of back away from that stubbornness to say, you know what? We're going to admit that writing our own uh, whole web thing didn't work out so well, so we're going to go with one of the ones that's actually really popular now. We don't want to be the browser that you use to download Chrome with anymore. Yeah. Well, and I mean, I wanted to like Edge. I think that it did some things well, like text rendering and scrolling just felt a little smoother mm -hmm. in Edge, but it just didn't have the features. I mean, for the longest time, you couldn't even right-click and save as, like if you wanted to download a file. It just, there was no save as option. It was going to your downloads folder whether you wanted it or not. Um, and, and having it based on Chrome, I mean, I've been have you guys been testing this? I've been testing the Windows 10 and Mac versions of, uh, of the Chrome beta, and it's fine. I mean, it's not, it doesn't, it's not a life changing. It's, it's basically Chrome without Google's hands all over it, which has its benefits. All right. Um, next up, we've got some news. This was a bit of a, a story, uh, the last week or so, uh, regarding Ubuntu and, uh, Scott was, 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 uh, very distressed for a while about this. Uh, but apparently, uh, so the background is Ubuntu was going to roll back support for 32 bit packages in 19.10 uh, and uh, I get 19.10 and 20.04 uh, long-term uh, LTS version, which was huge. Obviously that's, that's a ton of software and functionality that would have been cut or, you know, no longer supported in, in some way. And they got a lot of crap for it. There was a lot of commotion, uh, I don't, you know, I don't follow Ubuntu development, uh, so I, I didn't. I was only hearing this through like Scott in our chat and through 
you know, some more mainstream forms that were talking about it. Uh, but but apparently they they rolled that back. They rolled back that decision. And so now 32-bit applications will be supported through 2004, um, through the end of the life cycle of 2004, which is April 2030. So you've got some time uh, for 32-bit in Ubuntu, at least in their LTS branch. So Would you like me to explain it in the, one of the most horrible ways possible? Please do. The natural paths one. The, 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 the patient had cancer and the doctor is like, no, we need to cut this out. We need to stop this before it spreads. It is only causing harm. The naturopath said, well, no, don't worry. You, you can still keep doing it. I, it's going to be okay. Everything's fine. You don't actually have to do anything. Don't worry about, you know, the thing that's turning black and that people are busting into your shite because you're still running 32-bit stuff. And that's pretty much where it is. It, 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 they just said, you know what? Fine. It, we're doing this for your own good, but if you absolutely refuse to listen to us, here you go. Just try not to spread it too far. Interesting. Well, okay, well, that's one yeah. way to think about it. it. You, you have to have the backwards compatibility for certain things, like Wine and Steam required those i386 libraries, from what I understand. So... That, the, the hey, you know what? Not everybody needs to use four gigs of memory for the small program, and it's just easier to package it into a 32-bit thing. And, I mean, <clears throat> it can still be secure, depending on the programming. I mean, there's nothing inherently insecure with with IA32 that I know of. But it's just, you know, more complexity for the OS guys to, to, to have to focus on. I mean... Why support both things when you can just support one and really focus your attention on that and tune it for performance and security, but you've got, you know, 32-bit apps and you got 64-bit. But, yeah, I mean, you look at people with, uh, you know, certain basic applications and there's no need to use a 64-bit path, but, you know, eventually you're going to have to and eventually pull that Band-Aid off and... Get into the modern world, but yeah, I, I can understand some of the old crotchety assembly people just saying I've got a I've I've got a thirty six K size program that only eats up another six K of memory, and um, I don't need to do it in sixty four bit and increase the complexity of my code. And yeah, there you have it. That's my that's my get off my lawn. Chant. You sound like well, a why'd you move off sixteen bit then? Yeah, yeah. Uh, I don't know because sixteen bit was so nineteen eighty nine. It was a painful transition. Yeah. yeah, it's interesting. You know that they you know they mentioned uh, Steam in, in this article. I guess uh, some Steam uh, uh, executives had quoted or been quoted on on this decision, saying that look, if they're going to cut 32-bit support, Steam won't work. And that's interesting because also another OS that's dropping 32-bit support is, is Mac OS uh, with Catalina, I believe. Um, actually, I can't recall. It's Ca- I, don't, I don't know if Catalina is the one that makes the cutoff or it's the, the final one. I think it. I think Catalina does make yeah. the cutoff. But More regardless, importantly, who cares? Well, there's a lot of Mac users and Steam also, is Also, Catalina app. might be the worst code name for an OS I've ever heard. Well, they, they should have stuck Bring with Bring back the big cats. They yeah. weren't out of big cats yet. Uh-huh. Um, but, uh... Well, like so, Catamaran? Sure. Yes. Yep. But Sailing one of the, the Catalina? Oh, one of the things... Know, they, maybe they're subtly bringing back cats. Good point, Josh. Catalina. Well, what if it's like a it. catastrophe? Mm-hmm. Okay. Uh, well, in, in Mac OS, for the last version or so they've been warning you when you launch a 32-bit app saying hey this is going to stop working soon and one of those apps probably the most high profile of those apps is steam because steam does have a native mac client it is still 32-bit dependent and uh we'll see um you know what happens there is steam going to update you know their their client uh brett just confirmed for us in the chat that it is catalina that is dropping 32-bit support so that's coming up uh, so, obviously, they weren't willing to do it for Ubuntu, at least on Ubuntu's timetable with their original decision. 
they won't have to now, but what are they going to do in Mac OS? And, you know, we'll see. Um, okay. Moving on, we've got some more news here uh, from Intel. They had a uh, an announcement. I think it was, uh, was it Lisa Spellman? Somebody from tw- on their executive team um, went on Twitter and confirmed that Intel will be using integer scaling for their graphics uh, not not backwards compatible, but going forward with Ice Lake and beyond for their integrated products, and then as well as their discrete products coming out at some point in the future. And so uh, Scott wrote this up for us. He was surprised it wasn't in there, but uh, this is something about preserving graphical fidelity f- in- instead of trying to fix it through, you know, creative processing. And uh, people for, you know, pixel art style of games, certain text uh, representations things will will look sharper with, uh, or at least more authentic with integer scaling instead of, of uh, having it uh, having it scaled uh, and having it uh, with the filtering to try to smooth it out. But uh, do you guys have any thoughts on, on integer scaling and Intel's uh, dedication to this now going forward? We, we just talked about Macintosh a little bit, and in their defense, Apple has amazing integer scaling. It's called their Retina Display. So if you've ever seen one of those... They do this phenomenal job of basically taking a screen resolution that is double what the actual available real estate will be, and then everything gets like blown up like 2x up and down. So your 4K display is actually displaying a 1080p image, but it's it looks fantastic because of this integer scaling that they do at the OS level. And everything I've ever used inside of that on a Mac with a Retina display has looked just as good where with Windows, even though Windows 10 is the best Windows version yet for high DPI support, you'll still open that, you know, random app that has a ultra blurry looking box and you can, the text looks all smudged, which stands out against, you know, the really nice looking taskbar and now all of the like higher DPI icons and the text looks really good on Windows 10. So it if, if this means that a, a desktop using Intel Gen 11 graphics, where the graphics display engine is actually handling all of the scaling and not my monitor, and then it's able to do proper integer scaling if I'm able to like get a 4K monitor and maybe set it up for 2x, um, like 200% scaling in Windows. I I would love to see the difference between Windows native display scaling, my monitor, and what one of these can do, and. I, I'm already somebody who loves like, like playing retro games, DOSBox. There's a perfect pixel mod you can get that basically does integer scaling on a, a bigger scale than what DOSBox natively can do because they only go up to like 3x uh, scaling. And then you're still at the mercy of your monitor and, and your graphics card too. So this could be the perfect solution for playing those old low resolution games on like a Intel Nook or something with DOSBox. All right. Well, well, Stay yeah. tuned for that. Again, it won't be coming backwards. So if you, if you have an Intel product now, you're not going to get it. But going forward. Uh, all right. Last news story. We've As we talked about earlier, uh, Intel has had some issues with security patches. Uh, now we have something uh, for AMD as well. A, uh, a vulnerability for Epic processors has been discovered. But thankfully, there is a patch. Uh, so it may just be a matter of inconvenience instead of uh, insecurity or or uh, being being vulnerable here. So tell us about this, Jeremy. Uh, it, and it will end up just being a wee bit of downtime as you apply the microcode. It's uh, essentially if you're using Epic to run a series of virtual machines, uh, AMD uses something uh, called secure encryption virtualization to encrypt the data that's in the RAM that's being passed back and forth between the machines, the the VMs, to the actual machine. And each VM is given its own specific encryption key. There is a way to sort of feed at at the very start. Uh, So you don't necessarily need admin rights, but you need access as it's creating a VM to feed it a little bit of a fake chunk of cryptography which then has to match back to the master key to realize okay this bit's wrong so it's supposed to be this this bit is wrong this is supposed to be this and capture the data as it corrects what the encryption is 
And then you have to be, well, you know, uh, quite technically minded to be able to take that data and turn it into something. But if you can, you will actually be able to now know the exact uh, encryption keys of the RAM that's talking to the various virtual machines and maybe do something. Uh, we're not actually sure. We know that it's a vulnerability. It's just not how do you possibly take advantage of it. The more interesting part about this uh, story from uh, the register is they actually go deep into our link to how this actually works. So if you're, you're thinking that when they're saying that there's is an ECC issue, no, it's an ecliptic curve cryptography issue. It's, it's not error correcting. Uh, you, you'll learn if you want about uh, the Chinese remainder theorem to sort of deal with the incomplete cryptography keys that will let you build out into a complete one. It, it, there's a lot, of information if you follow the links through here on just you know how this sort of encryption works and if you wanted to sort of test to see if you were secure how you would go about doing so so and before anyone asks as far as i've heard there are no performance impacts whatsoever on this microcode update as opposed to some others so take a look if you're, you're interested, because a lot of the, the coverage of Spectre and Rowhammer and that doesn't really get into the technical details unless you want to go and dig up some white papers. This will lead you to some in-between stuff. Uh, expert reading, but not straight down into the actual nuts and bolts, uh, as you say. All right. And hooray for patches that don't kill uh, performance. Okay, let's uh, uh, make our promise of a short show come true and jump right into the picks of the week. All right, so uh, my pick is something to do with X570, and uh, if I hadn't been a bit ill the last few days, I would have had an article up already, but uh, over the weekend, I met with uh, Gigabyte, and they uh, unveiled the all the details of their X570 lineup, and uh, they've got uh, half a dozen, actually probably more than half a dozen motherboards uh expanding all the price points, although the price points I don't think are quite settled yet or public yet, but it's going to be a very large range of price points and features for X570. And as we know, uh, and, and so my pick is an X570 motherboard from Gigabyte. And as we know, the X570 chip set, chip set requires active cooling, or at least most of the motherboards coming out are going to have a fan on that chip set. And that brings back like, uh, horrific vietnam style flashbacks to enforce and previous it's generations of, yeah chipsets where the fans fail and they're hot and they're noisy and 40 millimeter fans are so 40 hot. millimeters yeah oh yeah and now we haven't tested any of this yet but we've been told you know it is several years it's a decade plus later the cooling going into these chipsets is not the same as it was back then the fans are going to be super quiet they're going to be reliable because this is, again, what the manufacturers and AMD are saying. But if you don't want a fan, if you really, really want to insist on not having that chipset fan, you're going to want to check out the a, uh, I'm sorry, the Gigabyte Aorus Extreme, which is their top-of-the-line X570 motherboard. Uh, I don't believe I can say the price yet, but it is pricey. They're, it's expensive. But just uh, think about how much you're saving on the processor compared to what you paid for that level of performance just a year ago. And it is the uh, world's only, or at least thus far, world's only X570 motherboard with a passive uh, cooled chipset. And the way that they did that is they've got this total total thermal system, I think they call it or something like that, where they've they've uh, made multiple layers of, uh, of the board into a massive heat sink. And it kind of connects to the chipset and up to the VRM and then down the back of the board where it can dissipate, and it's all just this massive, large heat sink. Uh, so that's how they can get away with um, passively cooling this X570 chipset. Uh, also, uh, part of Gigabyte's new features this generation is a true direct, fa direct uh, powered 16 phase VRM. So there's no doublers, it is true 16 phase, 16 direct phase 
powered for VR, VRM, which increases efficiency, which means lower temperatures throughout. So, so the whole board is cooler. Uh, the whole board is designed as this big, very thick, uh, rigid, durable heatsink. And this is going to be the one way, at least out of the gate here, where you don't have to have active cooling on your chipset. But like I said, it's going to be expensive. Uh, it's going to be more than you think, I, I'm pretty sure. But hey, that's the price you pay for the best. So check that out. The Oris Extreme X570 motherboard from Gigabyte. All right, uh, next up, uh, we've got uh, Jeremy. Yes, Jeremy. What have you got for us? Yeah. Uh, well, an NVMe drive that actually claim cleaves to Ryan's law. It Whoa, is right. 87 cents a gigabyte. It's not I mean, necessarily the seven cents a gigabyte. Maybe 8.7 cents a gigabyte. 8.7. Yes. In America, we use yes. decimal points, Jeremy. Unlike you and your whatever. Well, it doesn't use. translate so well up here, but it still translate very well. But yes, it's under 10 cents a gigabyte. That is the important part. It is perhaps not the most amazing one on the, on the market right now, but it is certainly got to be one of the cheapest. It's only going to be going for another day and four hours. So if you're tempted, you know, you might want to do it. Now, when you translate it into north of the border, it's, well, 13. It's 140. There's a $10 off code. So it's 129. Still ridiculously cheap for a terabyte of PCIe NVMe storage i you, you just a year ago this would be jaw dropping you you just would never have imagined this you, you would have been struggling to find a high-end samsung for this price now and you still would be because well they're more expensive but hey go for it it's uh, it's a damn good deal and then up up here in canada you get more time to think about it but down in america do it within the next uh, 28 hours or so, or else you might regret it. Oh, that means I got to edit this podcast immediately. No bed for me, because uh -huh. we got to get it out there before the deal runs out. Uh, and we've had we've featured the. I think there's going to be plenty of deals for that for that yeah. SSD. It's QLC. That's, it's just going to keep dropping in price. That's that's true. And uh, we we've, we've yeah. had this this drive as a pick several times. Uh, and, and I just do want to remind everyone again, as Josh said, a QLC drive. So it's going to be great for, uh, you know, short random workloads. But if you're using it to transfer large sequential writes, it's going to be very, very slow. That QLC flash is slower than a dense hard drive when you get Jim, past you're the depressing. cache. You're depressing everybody. No, but you I'm are just, the you are the QLC buzzkill of this. How podcast. would you feel if you bought an NVMe flash? You didn't realize it was QLC. You you got your uh, forty gigabyte Steam game and you want to copy it over, and it gets the first couple gigs like at uh, eighteen hundred megabytes a second, and then it drops to one hundred and twenty megabytes a second. Listen, listen, John C. Dvorak Jr. Oh my God! Uh, <laughs> no, 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 no. There, the mouse <laughs> is still around, and uh, whatever else he was wrong about and also qlc that's all i have to say why don't we just make the list of what he was right about that would be shorter Ooh. true i just i don't spend a lot of time copying large files back and forth for right. shits and giggles and a lot of people don't so you're probably fine but there's some it's important to know because i you know i was surprised when i started when, when qlc became a thing and i started looking at them and testing them i was like oh crap that's pretty slow. If you run a large database and you do a lot of backups, ignore whatever I've said because it will be horrible and you will hate it. Yep. If you're oh. in literally <laughs> any other position or... <laughs> yep. Okay, Josh, you've got something different for us. It is, and this is something that I've actually worked with this week. I mean, not everybody needs a universal projector drop-in ceiling mount kit, but if you do... This works really, really well. Uh, it's it's super adjustable. 
that big swirly thing kind of saved my bacon on the short throw uh, uh, projector that we have at work. I mean, you're able to adjust and center things and just really, and it's it's a heavy duty solid thing, super adjustable. It's got plenty of punch outs. Uh, it's got four positions you can put it in. As you can see, there's you know front, center, left, right, and the front, and then you know center, center. And uh, that's really all you need. I mean, it's a it's a good sturdy unit. It comes with some safety hardware, you know, wiring that you put up on the top that. If somebody shakes the room and it falls off the rails, it's not going to, you know, land on you 30 pounds of, of, of white steel love. Uh, so, yeah, it's, you know, it's it's an odd pick, but uh, it's really, really good for the price. That just drops in like it a is, ceiling tile. It's the same size as a ceiling tile. Yeah, you just you just replace yeah. ceiling tile with it. So if you've got really long ceiling tile, you got to cut the ceiling tile in half. You drop that in. You drop the ceiling tile behind it, and you're you're good to go. It looks like it would fit into that Global Foundries uh, hotel room. Probably. Yeah. Yeah. Hmm. All right. Well, that's the Universal hmm. Projector Drop-In Ceiling Mount. By Drop in. Amor is the seller. Or Amor. Amore. Amor. Um, Amor. Amor. MC right. Amor or Amore. All right. Sebastian, take us home. Uh, real quick, non tech related. Well, I guess sort of, unless you go into the process of how they make these things. But I am one of those hipster douchebags who has a record player. And well, I used to. It's packed away now because I have a child who destroys everything I love. But back in the day when I could actually enjoy things, uh, I was buying these records from a company called Music Matters Jazz. And they were taking, they were getting the master tapes for these old Blue Note jazz records from the 60s on loan from Blue Note. And they were using this all analog setup they had at a place called Coherent Audio, which is still there. It's Kevin Gray's mastering studio. And th- their whole thing is that they go straight from the analog tape through high quality uh, mixers and cabling right to a, an analog cutting lathe and they make the records the old-fashioned way with no digital processing at all. So those kind of started getting expensive and they were limited run. Blue Note, which is under the the uh, watch of one Don Waz now for the last couple of years, they are now basically doing the Music Matters Jazz thing over again. Same it's still Kevin Gray. It's still coherent audio. It's still pressed at RTI. It's still got the ultra fancy, like period correct tip on jackets and all that stuff, but they're far less expensive. The music matters stuff has gotten all the way up to where it's like $60 a record. These are 34 99 straight from blue note. Still expensive for a record, but you go into like a Barnes and Noble, someplace that sells mainstream vinyl reissues are like 10 to 20 bucks. These are really, really, really high quality pressings and I'm pretty excited about it. The record that's on the screen right here, this, et cetera. I've never owned this on vinyl. That's a really, really good Wayne shorter album. And I keep on saying, really, I apologize for that. And I'm done. Uh, it's got Herbie Hancock on it. So yeah, no, that's okay. Uh, so that's the new style of pressing records. The ones that last significantly, they're more robust than the original style. Well, RTI, it's interesting if you ever watch a YouTube video on how one of these pressing plants works. RTI is record, Recording Technologies Incorporated. And then there's huh. another plant, and I can't remember who the Quality Record Pressings. I think that's the one that's owned by Chad Kasem from Acoustic Sounds. But nah. they use like virgin vinyl and they, they watch, they have high quality presses. They watch the temperatures. They do, they're very careful about the cooling and stuff. Like big companies like United that press the majority of the, <laughs> the cheaper issues out there. Yeah. They're assembly line. They don't yeah, they don't care about the the stuff that really matters like if it like bubbles up or in the drawing process if the thing gets warped. Like you get inconsistency from the mass market cheap records yeah. and then these are made to much much tighter tolerances and they only use the same press like the stampers they only use for like 2 to 3000 records and then they throw them out and start over again. So oh, nice. And yeah, North Ranger beat me to my follow-up question or statement, which is, I'm really glad these weren't more masters that we lost in that fire at Universal Studios. They won't even admit, apparently, what was lost. No. But the theory, well, Michael It was Frenner, like four years ago, or 
more than four years ago when it happened. Kremer claims they lost the John Coltrane Masters, so they'll never have those back again. There's a bunch of stuff that's just gone. Yeah. So on any of the impulse stuff he did, they probably don't have the Masters anymore. There's like a safety copy that's a fourth generation copy somewhere in a warehouse or a Japanese collector might own. Who knows? But anyway. Yeah, I know that was a horrible loss. That Almost we like watching didn't those. Didn't even know about until later yeah. on, until the word got out. It's like when we see those yeah. horrible pictures of those uh, distillery uh, storage units just falling apart and yeah. barrels of whiskey all over the ground, which happened again this year. Yes, it did. Well, I have no idea what the hell you just said, but uh, at least you're passionate about it. I, I don't even. I don't know anything about whiskey, Jim. Well, me neither. As as well, we determined last bourbons. week, yeah, I buy I buy gallon uh, Costco bourbon by the gallon. So obviously, but hey, I'm not blind. I made the it. good stuff. But, yeah. yeah, yeah. But no, those uh, barrels could have fulfilled their purpose and been shipped over to Scotland to like say Kilhoman and been turned into proper Scotch barrels. But now, hmm. but is Kilhoman going out of business? No, but. Where the the bourbon first fill casks are becoming oh. very rare because rare. Well, well, the American everybody white oak is using them. Yep. Bah. Well, and the American white oak is pretty rare right now too, which is what we need. <laughs> huh. I thought it was pretty much weeds, but <laughs> they do cut down a lot. <laughs> <sighs> All right. Well, I've also been informed in the chat that apparently there was a uh, debate at going on while we recorded one of the, I guess the second democratic debate. Uh, so apologize if you had to choose, hopefully you chose wisely. I won't, I won't tell you which one was the wise choice. I live in Kentucky. So the democratic primaries are meaningless, but, uh, yeah. Awesome. Well, thanks for joining us, everyone. Um, that's the show again, just a quick reminder. We've got that steam gift card giveaway going on until July 1st. That's Monday at midnight at basically, or 1159 PM Eastern time. So head over to pcpro.com, get your entry in for that. Uh, join us in discord too. One of the ways to enter that contest is to join our discord. And, uh, there's a link in every podcast, uh, show note to the discord invite. And you can also do it through that, that, uh, entry widget for the gift card giveaway. So check that out. And uh, again, be sure to uh, go to pcpro.com slash subscribe so you know when we are going to go live. Uh, We're, again, not going to have the live stream next week, but we will have a show for you in the RSS feeds uh, at some point uh, late Thursday or Friday morning. So uh, thanks for joining us, everyone. Uh, We hope you have a great week. We'll see you next time.